Welcome back to Yamcha Sessions. Uh, as you know, this episode is us with Tun M. And it's a really special episode because mm-hmm. we have also got a signed Yamcha Session shirt by Tun M himself. Yes. So <coughs> what's going to happen is that what we are planning to do is we are planning to bid this out for the highest bidder. Mm. All right. So the tentatively, the date is on the 31st of August, in which is also Merdeka as well. Yeah. So just for information, the donation entirely will be, giving, will be given away to a charity house. More details will be updated in our social media, in Instagram and Facebook. So do follow. But if anything, there will be a bidding of the Yamchi, why is Yamchi pula? About the YCS shirt with Tun Mahathir's signature. And yeah, so do support us lah. This podcast is also brought to you by Bottom Slab. Which is the best pants on earth as per today. It has reflectors on the ends of the jeans and it's also really stretchy and comfy. I can now walk at night <laughs> without the fear of getting kicked by unseen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, use the code YAMCHA10 for a 10% discount at checkout. I hope you guys enjoy the rest of the podcast. See. <sighs> All right, guys, welcome back to Yamcha Session. And today, uh, actually, I'm so... <laughs> first time in my life, you know, and I work as an MC as well. But today, uh, Tun, I just want to say, when we were growing up, you were a person that we first saw in our textbook. You were a person that we saw in, in newspaper, in TV. Never in our life, we actually had a... We thought that this could happen. And we are very grateful to be here, to be able to speak to you. And generally, the essence of why we created this podcast is because that we felt that we want to contribute to the younger generations so that they'll be able to get advice or you know inputs from our podcast. And we strongly believe that today's podcast is really going to be very beneficial, not only for us, but for the future of Malaysia. So thank you so much for allowing us to be here today. We really appreciate your time. Yeah, it's, it's so real. Welcome. <laughs> okay, <laughs> good. Should we jump in? Let's go, man. Let's go. So to start things off, mm. I think the first question we want to ask is, uh, how did you navigate being a doctor, a politician, a leader of the country, a father? So many figures, right? Maybe you can talk a little bit about that. There's no need for navigation. <laughs> when, I, when I am practicing as a medical doctor, I concentrate on that. And at other times, I would be a politician. Uh, it has nothing to do with my uh, medical practice. Mm. I just uh, do what a politician needs to do, to explain things, to try and win support and things like that. My goodness. All right. It's, it's, it's still sinking in. I feel it's crazy that I get to have a conversation with you. This is insane for me. <laughs> yeah. Okay. okay. All right. So we, st- we, we came up with a few bunch of questions that we felt is going to be very helpful. So like, if you could actually turn, like right now you have a time machine, you could turn back time with the knowledge and the foresight and the experience that you have today. Mm. Right? What would you have done differently during your time as the Prime Minister, the first time as the Prime Minister? <laughs> knowing the social media, yeah. knowing about technology, knowing maybe about COVID as well. Not much really, the only problem is that uh, in the process of uh, working, I need to uh, appoint people to take on some responsibilities. But uh, before they they uh, they are appointed, they they seem to be very good people. But once they are appointed, the kind of authority that goes along with the appointment sort of change their attitude. They became, begin to abuse the authority given to them, the power given to them. And they do a lot of things which are wrong, which they themselves would uh, not like to see other people do. Do you think it's a result of having that power? That's why they, ha- they change? Yeah, I think to a certain extent, power corrupts. Mm. And mm. absolute power corrupts absolutely. <laughs> wow. And so, like, how do we find a balance? You know, when we have such power. Yeah. What do uh, you in the, in the democratic system, if a person uh, goes away from the uh, purpose he was appointed, 
uh, we can always uh, remove him mm-hmm. but uh, sometimes of course uh, removing a person is a very difficult thing and uh, we need to tolerate and to revise our opinion of the person Basically, you just got to do what you got to do, like, I guess. Should, oh. wait, should there be a process in which we can hold politicians accountable for the promises that they've made to the people? The process is there already. You are supposed to remove a person who has uh, deviated from the uh, uh, objectives that you appoint him for. But some people are very reluctant to take action against a person. And in Malaysia, it seems uh, people are not uh, willing to be unpleasant and uh, say that, well, you have gone away from the purpose for which you are appointed and therefore you should be removed. Uh, but uh, they don't say that. They seem to try and... Uh, and allow the person to go on and on doing the wrong things. I see. Do you believe this is a cultural... It's it's part of our culture to be amicable? It's to the Malaysian hospitality, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Overly so. To be a yes man, effectively. We take the example of a, a prime minister who has deviated from the purpose for which he is appointed. Uh, Prime Minister who has uh, committed some wrongs. Uh, normally, you either get him, get rid of him, or you leave him. Uh, you don't continue to follow him. But we find that people uh, still uh, do not want to do anything to maybe hurt his feelings or to show that uh, you are no longer. Uh, support, supportive of his uh, ideas and and the way he does things. We seem to want to tolerate and uh, let him go on doing things which we know is wrong, but uh, then but he is our appointed leader. Uh, our duty is to support him. Mm. Do you feel then in that sense there should be an adjustment to the system that we currently have today to disallow this level of leniency? Uh, it's a matter of culture. Uh, some people are very um, brash. Uh, they they criticise. Uh, even if it is their leader, they would criticise. And they would even suggest uh, that the leader be removed because he has not... Um, Uh, done the way that he was appointed uh, to do. But uh, in Malaysia, uh, there seems to be a reluctance to be unpleasant to a leader. Mm. Must be authority and power. <laughs> Goes back to the first question. It's not wrong. <laughs> like, because like, sometimes, right, you know, when you're in Kato class or something, when you do something wrong, you're like, it's okay, lah, you just follow him. You know, If you think about it, right, when we were young in school, I mean, yeah. at least that's just how it felt to me, you know? Yeah. Because when we were young, like, even with Ketua Daja, they do something wrong, it's just like, okay, you know? Yeah. Maybe. I think it's a cultural thing that we have been embedded since we are young. Possibly. That's true. Mm. Sometimes if we know a person has done something wrong and you remove him, but you don't take any action against him. You don't report to the police, for example. Mm. Uh, and as a result, the person moves on to another job And he does the same thing. Yeah, he does the same wrong things. And again, uh, there there is a reluctance to take action against him uh, legally. For example, uh, you report his wrongdoings to the police. Oh, well, well that's uh, too extreme. Mm, right. And well, let's just remove him, and uh, he can do what he likes where uh, somewhere else. And that leniency just lets him continue to do whatever he wants to do. Yeah. Tun, if you don't mind me asking, do you foresee this being our culture forever? 
Well, culture changes over time. Also, culture uh, can be implanted in people. But, uh, but that begins uh, with uh, consciousness that uh, the value system is wrong and we need to change it. When do we change it? We have to change it when the person is very young, yeah, at right. three years old, for yeah. example. Because if, if he is already mature and have, uh, has already absorbed certain values, it's difficult to change. But when he is very young, without any values of his own, then whatever you teach him will stick to him for his life. That's right. That's right. So the solution would be to change our country's culture from the ground up, starting with our children. Yeah, but then the leadership must know <laughs> uh, what culture to change, <laughs> what you should uh, do, uh, which culture you should follow. Uh, we have, for example, the Look East policy. Uh, the world was, uh, for hundreds of years, the world was uh, Western-oriented or U U Eurocentric. Right. Uh, we find that uh, at times uh, they were wrong and we need to change. And we choose the uh, culture of the countries of the East. And so we say, let's look East yep. and see wh whether their culture is better than the European culture we have absorbed. And once we have decided on that, you have, um, you have to implant the new values in, the, in our people so that um, their response, their action would be good for them and good for the country. Sorry, if you don't mind me asking, don't you think, and I'm not a total advocate for the Western nor the Eastern, I feel there are benefits and also the not so benefits of both sides, right? Mm. I feel that in Malaysia, even when I was a child, I used to watch a lot of television from the RTM1 to even Astro. Mm. And uh, I feel very, very privileged to be able to watch uh, American entertainment as well as the local entertainment and the Eastern, like Japanese anime and everything. Don't you think it's, it's uh, possible that we can take the good from both and learn yes, from them? Yes, absolutely. You, you must be critical. You must uh, e evaluate the, the culture. Which one is good, which one is bad? Mm. And we take the good ones and uh, leave out the bad ones. For sure, for sure. I think on the on the topic of educating the young, to my, at least from my perspective, mm. the best talents of our country, regardless of industry, uh, do not end up becoming teachers. And it is somewhat contrary to more developed nations where the best talents of their countries become teachers. Mm. How would you? incentivize the best of our talents to become teachers and teach the next generation. Yeah. It's again our value system. Mm. Uh, we think of uh, becoming engineers or doctors or, and when we cannot get into those uh, discipline, well, we'll become teachers. Right. And so you find the people who are rejected by other disciplines exactly. are taking up teaching. And of Obviously, if they are not good enough for for those uh, discipline, they cannot be good for the children. Yeah, that's right. They, are, they will not become a good model for the children. Mm. And they themselves would not know what is good, what is bad. So then our children will grow up influenced by these people who are uh, intellectually uh, inferior. How do we change that? Well, uh, it's uh, up to the leadership. The most important thing is the leader. If the leader is uh, interested in changing the value system, mm -hmm. then we'll see a change. But if the leader uh, feels that, uh, well, it doesn't matter, uh, I'm doing okay, 
if others don't do it okay, that that's way, yeah. uh, their business. <laughs> and uh, don't feel that you have a need to improve the quality of people in your own country. Then you don't uh, institute uh, processes for changing. I And of course, then you are settled with uh, your old... Uh, values and those values may not be good for you. For example, uh, there are some people who are very laid back. Yep. They they would like to well tolerate everything. Never mind. Mm-hmm. Uh, we can do this tomorrow. Sure. Or we can forget about it and do things our way. And uh, then there will be no change. Do you think as well that the education system has been perhaps making it a lot easier for students to pass rather than raising the standards of the country. Yeah, and there is a tendency to achieve good results. Yeah, it for looks example, good. For example, a <laughs> teacher would like to see his class do very well. Right. And uh, if he is allowed to set the question, then the question would be simple enough yeah. for the students to do well and the teacher, teacher feels that he gets a credit because his students all have done very well. But on the other hand, the students are not really capable. And then they may do the wrong things because they have not received the right instruction, the right uh, way of uh, using whatever knowledge that they have. I see. I just want to add one more. I know your father was an educator as well. What do you think personally? Because I'm sure you know your dad best. <laughs> uh, what do you think is a personality trait that your father had as a teacher that you think teachers today should adopt maybe? Perhaps it's a perspective or a, a motive. What yeah. do you think? Well, he was living in a very different environment. Mm. Uh, we were just uh, being introduced to English education to proper schools mm. and uh, the, most of the schools were uh, started by uh, Christian brothers yes uh, most of the teachers were Christian brothers and uh, the fear uh, in the families Malay families was that uh, if you go to school you might be converted to Christianity uh, but my father was uh, Uh, sure that education is good for him, that he can uh, improve himself. So he went to school without telling his parents. Oh, see, rebel. Yeah. <laughs> of course, later on they discovered, <laughs> but initially he went to school on his own without telling his parents. And he became one of the few Malays in Penang who was an uh, English educator. And uh, he felt that education was very important. So for us, his children, he insisted that we get good education. We all went to English school. Mm. And uh, at home, when we had to do homework, if he is around, we dare not uh, play around. We have to <laughs> focus on learning. <laughs> <laughs> cool, cool. I'm so scared, but actually, I want to ask right nowadays, right? Um, see, I I totally agree that education is very important. Like I personally did my masters last year, and I'm planning to get my PhD as well. But then now, as I go out in the working world, what what are being heard is that I uh, don't really need to do a degree. You don't really need a diploma as well. After I spend, we can just come and work and everything. Do you feel this affect sort of in a way affect the working industry? You know. Yeah, of course, of course, your education uh, plays a role. Accepting that the valuation of your education is not quite right. Mm. Uh, in the past, uh, they think that if you study geography and history, therefore you become a good administrator. It's not so, <laughs> because an administration is a different discipline altogether. Yes. And you are, the fact that you have said uh, you know about history, you know about geography, doesn't qualify you to become an administrator. But later on, we realize 
that administration is quite different from history or geography. Far off. Uh, so <laughs> now we have courses on administration. People must learn that, lo- know that this is the way you do things in an administration. And the quality of administration improved over time. Before, before, well, if you pass your senior Cambridge examination mm-hmm. in those days, or you thought to be qualified to do anything, but you are not. Sure. Because the knowledge that you have is not compatible with the work you have to do. You see, you must uh, learn about things that has uh, uh, implication or that uh, prepares you for the kind of work you have to do. Okay. With the changing landscape, though, um, for example, I'm born in 1992. That's before. I mean, it's nothing compared to you. I think you have you know a lot more <laughs> for sure. <laughs> I'm just a child, <laughs> right? But um, bo- being born in 1992, uh, we used to not have computers at home. Mm-hmm. And then when I was seven, I, w- I was very lucky to have my first computer. Seven. Yeah. Well, I got mine at <laughs> like. 16 or something. Right? But we are very lucky, right? And I think what we never predicted was the evolution of technology at its, at its pace, right? How do we future proof mm. the adults then, you know, in the future? Yeah. When you are born, you accept the environment. You do not know about the previous environment, the, uh, the lack of. Uh, uh, equipment and things like that that can help you. You live in a new environment where everything is possible almost. Mm. So you you don't uh, you you adjust yourself to these new technologies. Uh, for example, uh, in my days when I was a small boy, uh, broadcasting is done by a huge uh, uh, setup with a big uh, buildings and uh, aerials and things like that. But now in your pocket, you carry those buildings. It, uh, it, it's crazy. Yeah. And, it's crazy. And it is better than those buildings. It is. Because right. you can talk to somebody in New York and see his face I know. and talk to him as if he's there in front of you. So, but um, the, the younger generation take this for granted. They didn't realize that this is not available before. It was a big leap. So, and they feel comfortable. The old people are not comfortable. <laughs> I must admit that in many um, instances, I had to ask my grandchildren to do solve this thing for me because I, I couldn't <laughs> understand. So, for example, your your uh, this your phone, your mobile phone. You can do so many things. With that. For sure. But for me, mostly it is about that you see it as a telephone. <laughs> just I to call, Just to call someone. Toon, even at my age, I feel I have problems with the Touch and Go app. So don't worry, you're not alone. <laughs> even I also have problems. <laughs> <laughs> and I assume what you lack in uh, tech, like knowledge and technology, you more than make up for with everything else Yes. in every other department. <laughs> Well, I, I have to make adjustments, of course, because things are happening and I am responsible for, uh, in a way, I'm responsible also for the education of the people. Mm-hmm. So I had to move ahead, even though I, I'm not very conversant with the new technologies. That is why we started on the Multimedia Super Corridor 20 years ago. 20 years ago, people never thought about that. But we started it early because we see what is coming, that communication is going to improve. And if it's going to improve, how do we adjust our way of life? You see, now you are in contact. You are connected to everybody just by the phone. You can talk to anybody anywhere in the world. It's a different world altogether. Before... You're confined to your village. Yeah. You know only your family. <laughs> yeah. And at the most, you see the people in the village. And if you do business, uh, you make baskets, for example, 
for sale in the village. Hey, the market is very small. Yeah. You cannot get rich. But today, the world is a market. Online, you can sell anything uh, to the whole world. Oddly enough, you're still in the village. You, you can still be at home and sell everything. <laughs> not wrong. Yeah, not wrong. So, so the environment has changed. For sure. And you can make money. People like Bill Gates making billions of dollars. Why? Because he has access to the world. If he is confined to the village where he lives, <laughs> he wouldn't. He will not be a rich <laughs> you, person. You wouldn't be Bill Gates. Yeah. yeah. You know, speaking about money, right? Like, I'm um, jumping to another topic right now. The the ringgit's value has been deteriorating over time. Okay, this has impact like perhaps the cost of imported goods, the cost of local goods as well, and that raises the cost of living. Out of in your mind of view, everything has increased, but the wages of the labor. Of the rug, yeah. Uh, I would just say, uh, as simple as it is, why has why, in your opinion, right, has ringgit fallen off? And are we doing anything about this? Because when I know about money, when I was young, I think it was around three point two to the US dollar. Then today is what four point four. Four point four, I think. Like technology has been evolving, the culture has been evolving. If the ministers and the leader of the country say they are doing what they are doing, like bagus, you know, but for some reason we are. The ringgit doesn't the, reflect. The ringgit is going backwards instead of forward. You know, what are you, what, what do you think? About? Why is this happening? I think um, we are a little bit simple-minded. Mm-hmm. When the cost of living goes up, uh-huh. we think that the solution is to raise the salary. Then you can buy the higher pricing. But when you raise the salary, you contribute to the cost of living going up. Because uh, the workers will have to be paid more, and therefore your overheads gets more, mm-hmm. and the value of your product is also higher. And although you have raised the salary, you cannot buy more than what you used to do before, right? Because the cost of goods Went up and services well. will go up. So, the, how do you handle uh, and uh, this? Uh, Inflation or the rise in in the cost of living. The best thing, of course, is to find ways of increasing your productivity so as to conform with the increase in the wages. Mm. How do you raise uh, productivity? One of the best thing, of course, is to have a very lean uh, management. You are more efficient. And therefore, although you are you are you are have to pay more for the for the products, but you have uh, found a, found a way of increasing your product without increasing the cost. Right. Then, of course, today we have uh, automation. We invest in automation, and therefore, the rise in salary is not affected. Does not affect the productivity. Automation would increase the productivity For sure. on that. So uh, the other one is uh, uh, robotics. You use robots. Of course, you have to invest uh, a lot of capital money. in the robot. So between improvement, improvement in efficiency, uh, automation, and robots, you increase the productivity mm. to keep up with the increase in the salary. Then, of course. The the uh, increase in salary will actually buy more than uh, before. You see, but a lot of uh, especially unions uh, they think that the solution is to increase uh, their wages. When you increase the wages, you increase the cost of production, and you increase the cost of production, the wages will not buy any more than before. You see, so. We have to think carefully about this thing. During my time, I never raised uh, wages by more than ten percent. But when I sat down, they raised wages by twenty five percent. You raise you raise wages by twenty five percent. The cost of production will go even will higher. go up, yeah. and the value of the goods will be higher. And your increased salary cannot buy any more than. When you were 
uh, enjoying a lower or where you are getting a lower salary, but the cost of goods is, is also lower. Are we as a country making sig- or significant enough progress in the fronts of automation, robotics, robotics in order to reduce the co- effective cost of living? Well, don't that enough. <laughs> I think we, we need to make use of robots and automation much more, but also to improve the quality of our uh, management. Management is very important. Right. A good manager can make use of robots and produce um, much more efficiently. So between these three items, uh, there may be more things that you can do sure. to reduce the cost of production. But these three will be the important. So if you uh, uh, encourage the use of automation, the use of robots, then uh, you will... Because ro- robots can work for 24 hours. You just need to maintain. Uh, of course, they break yeah. down sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, basically, they don't ask for higher wages. <laughs> <laughs> they don't go up to their boss and ask yeah. for an increment. Uh, so <laughs> these are ways to mitigate the uh, increase in the cost of living. You see, But I see... Uh, every time I read in the papers, or oh, the cost of living has gone up, we must raise the wages. You raise the wages, you are contributing to increasing more more increases for the goods. in the cost of living. Right. So you've hinted at the fact that, I guess, overpaid managers are part of the problem. I like to draw a tangent to our minister's wages. There has been recent news that ministers have been getting 40% increments in recent times. Do you feel that that's justified? Well, I don't think so. During my time, the ministers were not paid very highly. <laughs> but uh, that means that uh, people don't uh, fight to become ministers. They see this uh, politics as a way of making money. Mm. And they lose sight of the objective of politics is to create a better, a better uh, uh, environment, a better country, a developed country. So we find them being highly paid, but not productive, yeah. because uh, lots of people uh, gain their place through popularity. Right. And pol- popularity is not always based on ability. Yeah. You see, you have a base of making yourself very popular, like giving money to people. You become very popular, but you don't know how to make the money. <laughs> and then, therefore, you have to steal the money. So, mm. that uh, that is a problem that we face. We are being very paid very high wages, but uh, we are not productive. Right. Uh, we should not make uh, the the ministerial posts too attractive financially. That's if you right. do that, you, you will find lots of people who will, uh, well, who will want to become uh, ministers, not because they can contribute, but because uh, they want to make money for themselves. Okay. Yep. And I suppose this also stems beyond their reported fixed base salary. Uh, I, I I believe they also have additional allowances. They we have yeah. uh, benefits, personal dealings that may or may not incur. Yeah, well, basically you should pay a salary that uh, based on the productivity. Of course, uh, senior uh, executives, if they are productive, then they are entitled to be paid. But now they say that, well, as long as you are a senior executive, irrespective of your performance, you must be be paid high salary. Right. And that is a a very negative way of it. People like uh, Bill Gates, he is entitled to make billions for himself because his contribution is, well, uh, is what uh, enables the company to do well. But when you have a person with a title, 
but does not know how to improve the productivity or the quality of work, then you shouldn't pay that kind of money. Should hold his salary. Yeah. <laughs> Out of curiosity, right? Who dictates how much a ministers get paid? Like, like say if I get into position, I'm like, all right, this is how much you're going to earn, or something. Is this something that the new government would decide, and or what? I'm afraid that the the minister dictate the salary. What? <laughs> practically, Serious? practically, Total. because there are members of the cabinet, they have to right. approve whatever uh, expenditure of the government. Wow. And among the things they can approve is uh, the uh, salary that they get. Uh, you must remember, Lee Kuan Yew, for example, said uh-huh. that the Prime Minister is a very important person. He should be paid highly. Mm-hmm. And he paid himself $1 million. You see? But uh, if you ask a person to pay uh, uh, according to what he values uh, is his contribution, then you are going to have uh, yeah. the wrong kind of uh, yeah, return on your contribution. Well, we can see that. <laughs> you know, I mean, I'm seeing the contribution right now. If that's the case, right, is it fair that we assign KPI to the ministers so that the public can monitor? Yeah. And then we'll be like, you have not been doing your job shouldn't be paid. Perhaps it's a bit of transparency yeah. so that everybody understands or a goal that he needs to achieve. Yeah. Well, they are very secretive of what they it do. It feels so. It yeah. feels that way. Yeah. <laughs> they only tell the among themselves. Mm. And there is a um, well, tendency, of course, that uh, you scratch my back, I'll scratch your back. It feels that of way. Course. It feels that way. Tak lah macam ni. That's all I got to say. Tak boleh lah. I mean, but also like, the oh yeah, I think it's the same. Because I wanted to ask about the allowances, but I think the answer is the ministers approve the allowances and such well. and such, right? Sounds like the dream job yeah. for me to dictate my own salary. Yeah, it sort of like makes people who sort of maybe not qualified or want to still be in politici- politi- politics simply because it's very lucrative, very orientated, yeah. you know? I think that's not right. Uh, so, as a prime minister, like say for example, if you see the wages going a little bit too high, he or she dictates the, the wages to be lowered. So he makes the decision. Ayo, okay. <laughs> interesting. All right, <laughs> cool. Well, wow, so that's good to know. So yeah. to to jump on to uh, our next, I guess, topic of discussion. Uh, at least my sense of this conversation is you are a champion of meritocracy, uh, right? You should be paid what values and you contribute and you bring to the table. Um, I think a lot of uh, at least non-Malays in this country view Bumiputra rights as something that is inherently unfair, at least from their perspective. Mm-hmm. My question to you is, how would you justify... Bumiputra rights to the average non-Bumiputra. Mm. If the intention is to help the poor, yeah. why not just help the poor directly? Well, in any society, the rich, the poor is a, always against the rich. And that can escalate to the point where they even have revolution. They want to get rid of the people who are rich. As you see in France, in Germ- in uh, Russia, they uh, they kill the kings. You see, because they think yes. that while well, you're right. making too much money, we don't have, and we need to be properly reimbursed. And uh, the, the the society becomes unstable. Mm. There is conflict between rich and poor. But when the rich and poor are also identified with the race the potential for uh, instability for uh, an uprising of the poor is much greater. And when that that happens, the country becomes unstable. And when the country becomes unstable, the rich will suffer and the country will suffer. Because uh, stability is essential in order to develop a country. So to avoid that, we have uh, what uh, was called affirmative action. That's right. 
Affirmative action is something that was tried in America because they find that the blacks were left far behind and there is conflict that is uh, due to the the division between rich and poor. Also, the, the poor are usually the blacks and uh, whites are the rich people. So right. these two factors cause a lot of um, antagonism and re- often results in violence. So to avoid violence, we need at least to reduce the the gap between rich and poor. Mm. Not to be absolutely everybody t- to be rich, but the gap must be uh, reasonable. A certain percentage uh, of uh, different is allowed. This sure. uh, so that we, we have tried to to do that under the new economic policy. But unfortunately, we succeeded only in certain areas, but not in other areas. For example, we give a lot of scholarships to Malays who, according to their performance, is not as good as the others, but it shows that they can they can uh, benefit. For example, uh, in the medical profession, at one time Malaysia, only 2% of the uh, uh, doctors were Malays. Under the new economic policy, we raised it to 40%. Wow. Very, very good. Uh, very impressive. And they are, they are good doctors. I mean, I am able to trust my... <laughs> you are uh, a doctor after all. <laughs> it's okay. You trust, trust your opinion. No, but <laughs> I, uh, when I um, had, had a heart attack, I, I didn't want to go to the Mayo Clinic. I had my operation done here because I trust them. They, they can do the work. And I have been to hospital <laughs> four times for very serious ailments. And they they have been able to treat me. So, although uh, in their SPM or in higher education, their score is low, but given the chance to be trained, they can perform. So, we are correcting in that area. That part is successful. But then we come to the business area. Mm -hmm. Now, business is something that is quite strongly related to culture. You have to have a certain culture to succeed in business. For example, you must work hard. You must be honest. You must do the right things. All these things are needed. But uh, when we created opportunities for the Malays, they only see a quick return. How do you do it? We give them a contract. They sold the contract. Mm. We give them a license. They sold the license. I've been hearing that. We give them AP. They sold the AP. And as a result, the gap becomes bigger because the benefit of this uh, move under the new economic policy benefits those who know how to make use. Yes, how to take advantage of it. So we are still saddled with that. On the education side, we think that we have done fairly well. But on the business side, uh, the and you know, business is enriching. Yes. So they still remain uh, very poor. Uh, the lately, of course, we are very concerned because they are poor. They are selling whatever they have, and among the things that they sell off will be their land. And see, their land r- running away from the city. Before in the city, there will be some kampongs in the city, like yeah. Kampong Kerinci, Kampong Abdullah Hukum, and all mm. that. Yeah. But now they're selling the land and moving out. You see, but the town is catch, catching up on them. They move out to this place, the town enlarges and reaches them. Again. And yeah. again, the value of the land goes up. Somebody offers a good price. They sell and they move out. This is division, uh, f- physical division. Not only between rich and poor, between race and race, but between location where they are found. Now, this is dangerous because eventually the poor will well do something violent. Uh, although in Malaysia we are fortunate, we are not violent people. You see, But uh, eventually, desperate, you get events like the Mete Tinsile uh, uh, 
right, yeah, race right. riots. You see, this B thirteen is a very good example of that. When we became independent, we got rid of the British uh, policy yes. of uh, not allowing locals to develop. Uh, but we, when we became independent, everything is allowed. Uh, for example, the British didn't want to give any license for banking because banks uh, will stimulate growth. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can only <coughs> borrow from uh, the, from their banks, yes. chartered bank, HSBC, Mercantile Bank. So the moment we became independent, the license was given. Uh, two people who understand banking, they happen to be Chinese. Two licenses were given: Blend Banking, EMBC, and many other things that were uh, reserved for the British, including uh, land. Huge pieces of land were given to British companies. Malaysian cannot. Malays get one or two acres. Mm-hmm. Chinese get nothing. But after independence, then they can actually buy over all this estate. So the gap is. Uh, Widening, and we worry about <coughs> this. We worry that if the Malays are move out and poor, and you know, poor people will always complain. They will always blame somebody else, not not themselves. Mm. So that is why, despite uh, some <coughs> little progress we have made uh, with the new economic policy, certain aspect must be made, must be retained. But the approach must be different. We cannot give contracts to Malays so that they can sell. Yeah. Now, if you sell, it is invalid. It's no longer uh, accepted. You see, so they will have to do it themselves. And we have training programs for them to understand the management of money. Money to them is something that you change for something else. Is It's just an exchange, yes. uh, but money as capital uh, is not a Malay thing. The, their right. culture doesn't regard money <laughs> as capital. <laughs> But the Chinese, I mean, for five thousand years, they, they have always been doing business. That's why they survive anywhere they go. It feels you know? that way. Uh, It feels that way. Even <laughs> if they go to America, I they, see, yeah. even Canada, they are doing very well. We see them everywhere. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> even Malaysian Chinese now can take contracts in Australia, build for the Australian. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> so it it kind of feels more like a cultural. It does feel that way. Issue and that's why this act is that is to like, in a way, protect or prevent. Is it like a to level the playing field? In prevention a way. is to level the field. Is it? Feels that way, but my my question is: so we were speaking to Said. Uh, I'm, I, you were, as you were watching our video, Said Sadiq. Said Sadiq, he was saying how perhaps a review of the the policy is necessary, right? Mm-hmm. Who is held accountable, and is there no date or is there no firm? You know, if I'm not mistaken, when this was created uh, by Tun, the second prime minister, mm. right, there was supposed to be like a cut off date. It was supposed to end at a certain moment, right? But it's still being continued. I'm sure there are reasons to why. Shouldn't it at least be reviewed, or maybe we can open it to the poor Chinese and Indian as well? I don't know. I'm just trying out my luck right here. <laughs> <laughs> no, I I have been privileged to watch things over eight years. Eight years. We were all poor people under the British. We were all poor Chinese, mm-hmm. Malays, Indian. We were poor. The Chinese and Indians came here to work as As laborers, you know, yeah. we're poor. but the culture is different. <coughs> the Japanese Chinese work hard, you know. They they send their children to school, and they they make progress on their own without any help. In fact, with obstruction put in front of the Chinese, they can overcome the the uh, challenges. Yeah, that is why if we ask uh, Jeff Richer. His parents came here. His great grand, grand, grandfather came here as what? And during the British time, no progress. Only after independence, you can check on all of them. 
all of them were successful only after independence. independence. Right. When the country was ruled basically by Malays, you see, there was no obstruction like the British. The British, you know, they gave twenty-five uh, thousand acres of land for a rubber estate at five dollars per, per per acre forest land, and they chopped down chop. all the trees and all that. But the Chinese cannot buy land at all. The Malays can buy one acre, two acre. You see, that was British policy. Mm. But after independence, the Malays can buy whatever land, but they don't have the money. So many, many of the estates belonging to British now belong to the Chinese, mm. because they have the money and they know the management. Management is very important. Mm. You can acquire mm. assets, but you don't know how to manage the asset will fritter away. You see, so we worry that. Uh, Despite the new economic policy, the gap between rich and poor, between Malays and Chinese, is uh, still widening. That is why at one time we achieved twenty percent. Now it's down to seventeen percent, because the economy is growing. Yep. So although you hold that amount, That's if right. that amount doesn't grow with the economy, the percentage goes down. That's right. So these are problems. Real problem that we face, and uh, of course, uh, we need to be popular to win election. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. Yeah. I mean, I it 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 feels as if it's a double-edged sword when it comes to it, you know. And I I totally understand when you say how it brings up, for example, the education aspect on how you have raised it to now forty percent of doctors is incredible. I feel it, but at the same time, the other reverse side of the blade, it makes maybe the Indians and the Chinese feel as if they are just guests in this country, and it's just a bit of myself. But when I was a kid, I used to look at my textbooks and I used to see your face on it, and I used to dream, although it's a foolish dream, to be prime minister one day, <laughs> right? Yeah. Foolish child. Yeah. I asked my my dad. My dad told me you would never be a prime minister in this country. And I, I spoke to my teachers. They told me you can dream, and I was devastated, you know. And I am a Chinese person. I don't speak Chinese. I don't speak Cantonese, and I don't speak Mandarin. I'm a failure of a Chinese. In a, in, you know, a lot of Chinese people tell me that. I think the saddest part is when I identified as being a Chinese, not being able to be a prime minister, and my own Chinese families and friends tell me that you don't speak Chinese. You aren't Chinese. It makes me wonder that am I born in this country and I'm never welcomed here? Am I just a guest or am I just a pendatang like everybody calls me on Facebook, on Instagram and everything? It's not that it happens regularly. I feel that when people do say that, it hurts. So do you think maybe perhaps this country, what it needs is just a little bit of understanding then? I think there is understanding. You know, uh, there are things that we do for the Chinese, which we cannot speak out too much because the Malays will feel that we are concentrating on the Chinese. I met three students in London in Hyde Park, and I talked to them, and they were studying in British universities. I asked them, "Who finance you?" Their parents, yeah. their parents. It is obvious that rich Chinese parents can afford to send their children abroad, but there are poor Chinese parents who cannot. Yes. So what did we do? We started twinning arrangement between Malaysian institution and foreign institution, so that you can get an English education in here in Malaysia, two years here, one year in. In Europe, mm -hmm. so it doesn't cost very much. So we find that when we had this twinning arrangement, most of the students were not Malays. Most of the students were Chinese I see. and a few Indians. You see, those who can afford, because uh, education in Malaysia is very cheap, very cheap it by is. comparison. You want to send to England? There's transport, there's mm -hmm. rent, housing, all kinds yeah. of things. 
You see, That's right. so because of that, we balance the number of Malays going abroad with the number of Chinese going to twin twinning programs. And these twin universities now have become full flesh universities. You go there, you can get the same kind of education that you find in England or in Australia. That was done. And if you take an, uh, figures as to the numbers, uh, you, the, the, the numbers are not actually balanced. Still, the number of Malays with uh, higher education is less than the number wow. of Chinese. Mm-hmm. Because those who can afford send their children abroad. To, I went to Cambridge. I went to uh, Cambridge University recently. The students who greeted me were all Chinese, only three Malays, all the rest were Chinese. And they were all private students, mm. uh, no, no scholarship. They can afford it. But those who cannot afford, they can go to a local university that is twinned with a foreign university. Now the local university is um, uh, accredited, fully accredited, and you don't have to go to the UK. And uh, if you care to look at the population of the universities, the, the medical international medical university, when it was started, not a single Malay student, not a single, until they <coughs> appointed uh, Dr. Baka as a uh, chancellor, he realized that uh, the population of the student is not balanced. So he asked uh, Mara to give scholarship. Mm-hmm. So Mara gave 10 scholarship, but 10 is very small. Yeah. Yeah. So in the local universities, private universities, the most uh, number of students are not Malays. Most Malays are go to the government university if they get a scholarship. Without scholarship, no way. None of them can afford. So this is a balancing act which we cannot uh, always talk about. We I talk see. about this, the Malays get angry. You talk about the Malays, the Chinese get angry. <laughs> so uh, it's, it's a difficult Situation. task. Yeah. You know, when you are in a position like I was as Prime Minister, I had to balance all these things. But I don't have to tell people all the time. Mm-hmm. I cannot tell people all the time. It must have been really tough. It must have been really tough. But it is what it is. But you must appreciate that despite the differences between us, Malay, Chinese, Indian, different religion, different language, different culture, Malaysia is still stable by comparison to most of the other multiracial countries. Very it, is. it is. Uh, it is. Uh, and I am very proud to be a Malaysian, for sure. I mean... <laughs> Getting married to a Chinese. So, <laughs> <laughs> Multiracial right there. I think we are yeah. almost running out of time. Yeah. I think we just yeah. move on to our, our, our last question. Right? Yeah. Knowing the state of the country today, right, what would your advice be to the average Malaysian out there who are watching? What will you tell them? To, you know? yeah. Sorry. What will you tell the average Malaysians who are watching our podcast today? What advice would you give to them? Be serious about democracy. Don't think that democracy is a way for you to make money. If you are bribed to vote for somebody, you can be sure that somebody is not good. Anybody who bribes you. We find that today bribery plays a very big role in our life now. Because everything is uh, about bribery. So if you choose people who promotes bribery, who practices bribery and corruption, then you are going to have bad government. A country can only develop if it has a good government. So be careful about voting. Don't just uh, vote because you get $200, $300, you vote. And you say to yourself, well, I only mind one vote. It doesn't do any harm, but it does a lot. We are now having a very 
sorry to say this, incompetent government, not knowing how to solve problems. They have ideas about policies and all that. But when you frame a policy, you must know how to carry out. If you don't, that policy becomes useless. Supposing you say you want to reduce the disparity <coughs> between rich and poor, how do you do it? If you don't know how, it doesn't do. It doesn't happen. You see, you must know how to do things. You know, you make a uh, make a proposal. You <laughs> must know how to carry it out. Government is not just about making policies, but it's also about overseeing that the policies are implemented. So the civil service, they know how to implement, but sometimes uh, they don't. They don't, and sometimes they are interfered with by a politician. Then, of course, you have bad results. Thank you very much. For that, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for your time, Tun. Actually, you, I'm Tun. going to sneak a ninja question. Why is your nickname Shadet? Yeah, Shadet. <laughs> yeah, what? What? I, I actually wrote that down, but I didn't really. A ninja dad. But Malays tend to shorten the names. Oh, you know, everyone. If you're an Osman, they call you Man. Mm. You right. You, you, if you are Hashim, they call you Im. Oh. Im only. They shorten the name. So I, my name was Mahadev, not a very usual name. So they call me Dad. Huh. Dad, and of course, uh, as a kind of endearment, is Jack Dad. Oh, interesting. So that is the uh, name that um, my family calls me, and my friends call me Jedet. You see, so when I started writing in Singapore, I don't want to put my name in. I want to put something <laughs> else that people can identify. <laughs> so I put C H E D E T Jedet. You see, that is my pet name. <laughs> the mystery has been solved. Thank you so much for your time. Today. <laughs> <laughs> I really appreciate it. We appreciate welcome, your time very much. <laughs> okay. If All you right. don't mind, I have a gift for you. Oh. Let me get it for you. <laughs> so now we know Shadet. Yeah, now we know the story. <laughs> yeah, we can't believe it. Okay. Oh, we have a small gift for you. We, have, I think John did some research. He, he, he said that you like going to Japan. Is that true? You yeah, like Japan? Going to Japan on the sea. Ooh. Oh, okay. I go to Fukuoka. The strange Actually. thing is that I go to talk to young Japanese uh -huh. about Japanese culture. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> that is quite interesting. You see, because they are getting confused. They see Western culture and their parents teach them the Japanese culture. Japanese culture, right. And it's, uh, they, they don't know which one to choose. To do. <laughs> so they're a confused generation. <laughs> Small gift. <laughs> I know you're a big fan of Japan, and I know you also went to see uh, Shinzo Abe and yeah. respecting him. I too am a big fan of Japan. We haven't really ended it. Oh, we haven't ended it. Yeah. I mean, we can end it, I guess. But I don't know whether you are familiar with the Daruma. Have you heard of it? Upper two. two. <laughs> the Daruma is a doll where you draw in one eye for focus. Second eye when you have fulfilled your, your goal. So I got oh. this for you. Oh. A white daruma is uh, in significance of health. So I hope. Uh, yeah, then you they're upside down. No, you're just meant to rest. Mm. So uh, this is for you from all of us. Thank you. A simple gift. <laughs> yeah. Um, we would like to ask you if you could sign a couple of shirts because we want to, to donate the proceeds to a charity, if you don't mind. Oh, you have a pen on standby? Wow, yeah, she's yeah, Prime Minister yeah. twice, man. Your pen on your shirt. You, you want to hold the shirt so you can sure. sign? Yeah. Here is a pen for you. you grab the second shirt over. One more shirt for you. This is for us personally. just want to hang in our wall, you know?
I am currently reading your book right now. <coughs> <laughs> That's why I was asking about Chidit, if you don't mind. Jonathan. Ah, oh, it's okay. I think your name, I'm happy enough. But my name is John Andrew Foyge. Can you shout over there? May 2nd. 2nd of yeah. August. Sorry, I'm going to take advantage while you're here. Thank you so much, Jim. Yeah, you guys we haven't really okay. like end the podcast. <laughs> oh, it's fine. Oh, it's fine. Uh, okay, okay. You take the photo together. Mm. Then I can help you out. Yeah. Um, should we stand here? Oh, okay. We can stand against the wall. Okay, sure. Thank you for spending time with us today.